Thanks, Amy, and thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Um, it's always good to be at the Archives and History. I think these folks do a fantastic job of, uh, of making history interesting. And, um, you know, history is interesting. And uh, I, I often wondered how some of the history teachers that I had along the way managed to make it anything but that. Um, you know, history is story, right? And people's stories are are. Uh, are are interesting. I, I, um, I think my interest in history comes, I think I came by it naturally. Um, my grandfather um, was a man who lived to be 103 years old. Um, he was born in 1856. Uh, he died in 1959. And so he literally remembered the Civil War, but lived until the beginning of the uh, Civil Rights Movement and also the Space Age. And so, um, and he was, he was a sharp guy, and he loved to tell stories. And he used to tell me stories about his memories of the last days of the Civil War. And I thought about those stories and they came back to mind when we came to the 150th anniversary of the war. Um, and I also began to think at that point about, um, I had some cousins who were kind of family historians and genealogists and they did more of that kind of serious work, serious preservation of the family history than I had done. And one of the things that they had done, and these were uh, cousins who were scattered from Alabama to South Carolina to uh, uh, other parts of the South and the country, but a lot of them had preserved either copies of or had made typewritten copies of letters written during the Civil War uh, by members of the Gilliard family. And so one of the things that I decided to do um, was track down those letters that they had um, carefully and sometimes really quite lovingly saved for posterity and to collect all of them that I could find and then to put them in a stack chronologically and read what those letters told us in real time uh, about that war and that time of both hero heroism and tragedy uh, in the life of our country. Uh, a time that, uh, that, that probably uh, made us better in some ways because it ended the institution of slavery, but it was also a time of, of terrible uh, bloodshed and cost. More American soldiers died in that war than in any other uh, war that our country has ever fought. 622,000, give or take, depending on whose estimate you believe, and all on American soil and a disproportionate number of them uh, being Southerners, uh, including some members of my own family, some of my ancestors. And so I, I was thinking about these things, and I started to remember um, the, a day that my grandfather and I sat down on, a, on the porch of what we in the family called the big house. It was an, literally an antebellum house. It didn't have the Grecian columns that you think of on the movie sets or Tara or something like that. It was a Gulf Coast cottage in Mobile, but it was built in 1836 and it had this veranda, this front porch um, that had a rocking chair that my grandfather liked to sit on sit and, and just kind of gaze out at the, uh, at the oak trees and the azaleas and all this kind of thing. And, and he, I was nine years old on this particular day, and he was 100. And he said, I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me when I was nine years old. And this would have been in April of 1865. He was nine years old. And they knew he, the family lived in Monroe County, uh, just outside of Monroeville, in a little place uh, called Purdue Hill. Um, and they knew that the Civil War was coming to an end. They knew that the South had lost, that there was no way um, uh, that, that, that the cause could really realistically be resurrected. And yet they had not received word of the surrender at Appomattox yet. And so 
it turned out that all of the, the males of fighting age were still off uh, in the war. And so my grandfather is a little boy and his mother uh, were at the family place in Monroe County. And he said there was kind of a dirt road that curved around the outside of the property. And they heard the sound of hoofbeats coming down this road. And they thought that it must be the Yankee soldiers. Um, and they were quite frightened and didn't know what was going to happen. And they looked out the door, and it actually wasn't the Yankee soldiers. It was a small uh, ragtag band of Confederate cavalry uh, galloping south as fast as they could go to get away from the fighting. And my grandfather said his mother rushed out to the fence to exhort these soldiers. And she said, what are you doing running from the Yankees? For heaven's sakes, go back and fight. That's what he said that she said. And he said, uh, I won't tell you what they said. Uh, they, were, uh, they were not enthusiastic about that. They knew the, the, the shape of history and the end of the war was coming. Now, my grandfather told me that story. And I remember even as a little kid, it bothered me. And the reason why it bothered me was that, that his son, my father, and a bunch of my uncles and other people were big Civil War buffs. And they had uh, read, and I had even, I was a pretty uh, prolific reader for a kid. I loved to read even from the beginning. And so I had actually tackled some full length books about the, the Civil War. Um, I remember. Um, there was a book called I Rode with Stonewall by a guy named Henry Kidd Douglas, who was a young soldier in Stonewall Jackson's brigade. And, and uh, I had actually worked at reading that at the age of nine. And all of the stories that my father and his generation told me about the Civil War sort of draped it in glory. They, they talked about the bravery of these great generals like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and the cavalryman Jeb Stewart and about the bravery of the men who fought under them. Um, and so the Civil War seemed like kind of a, uh, a, a wonderful thing to think about, the sort of the grand lost cause of the South. And yet in my grandfather's recollection of it, which was a personal recollection, not one generation removed, uh, it was something shrouded in defeat, and other stories that he told me through the years had to do with the bitter aftermath of that war and the sense of loss and, and, um, and tragedy that he felt uh, where that war was, was concerned. Now, of course, both of those truths, I mean, both of those things can be true at the same time, right? There can be, it can be a, a war in which people fought bravely on both sides of the war and there were great generals and people had a sense of the cause they were fighting for and all of those things and a time of great tragedy and bloodshed and loss. Those truths are not mutually exclusive, but to a kid of nine years old, it seemed like it ought to be one or the other, right? And uh, so I kind of agonized about this and thought, well, wait, wait a minute, which is right? What, what kind of war was this? And I thought about this and, and uh, sort of brooded about it as little kids do uh, for a while. And then the time came when I was a teenager that I didn't think about it much at all anymore. Um, because um, one of the things that happened was that civil rights replaced civil war uh, for me as kind of the cornerstone of Southern history, Southern identity, what it meant to be somebody who grew up in Alabama and the, the South. And I want to talk about that a little bit and talk about the path through that and then back to the Civil War because I wrote a lot about civil rights but, and didn't think I would write about the Civil War but then wound up doing it after all. One of the things that happened for me when I was 16 years old was that I was on a high school field trip to Birmingham. I lived in Mobile, was raised in a very traditional Old South family, nice people, good people, but very much a part of the status quo. Not cruel, but not uh, very sympathetic to the push for change that was beginning in the, in the civil rights movement. And I hadn't thought much about it. I thought more about the University of Alabama football. That's the side my family was on, Alabama, not Auburn, in the great chasm of Alabama life.
Um, and um, so, you know, I th thought the things that a kid thought and didn't really think much about these changes that were taking place. But I went to Birmingham on this field trip and happened to be there on the day that Martin Luther King was arrested and taken off to the Birmingham jail. It was Good Friday, 1963. Um, and um, that that was during that time in jail, that was when he wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. I didn't know any of that. All I knew was I saw two policemen shoving this smallish African-American man down the sidewalk, and when they pushed him past where I was standing, no further than from me to the front row of seats here, I saw that it was Martin Luther King, and I could see very clearly the look on his face. And of course, I don't really know what Dr. King was thinking in that moment, but, but I saw the look in his eyes. And for me as a teenager, what I thought I saw was not fear, which I might have felt if I had been in that situation, and, and not anger, which I might have felt also. Uh, but what it seemed to me that I saw in his face was this deep sadness. And my adolescent mind took a picture of that, and the face of Martin Luther King became the face of the civil rights movement for me and the changes that the South was being asked to contemplate uh, in its most fundamental ways of doing its business. Um, I came to believe, it wasn't that I suddenly understood all of that in that moment, I didn't, but it was something I couldn't put out of my head and it began to be the thing I thought about as I finished high school and went to college, got to college the same year that the first class of black undergraduates arrived at, at Vanderbilt, and so there were a lot of discussions about these kind of things, and it seemed to me that in that period of time, we were being asked in the South um, to think about who we really were and what really mattered most to us. Were we... Um, were we people who believed with the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal? Did we believe what we had been taught in Sunday school, that we were all children of God, and if, the, if that was the case, then we would all be brothers and sisters of one another? It seemed like to me that these kind of fundamental questions were being raised and called, and we were being made to consider these things uh, in our part of the South in those days. I also came to believe as I watched all this unfold as a college student and then as I graduated from college and began to write about it uh, as a young newspaper reporter, I also came to believe that our part of the country uh, was able to give some pretty good answers to those basic questions, that we were able to give better answers certainly than we could have given uh, when the civil rights movement started that we really did try, as Dr. King said, to be true to what you said on paper um, and to live up to the uh, requirements of our sort of Jeffersonian heritage, uh, that uh, those wonderful democratic ideals that make America the best idea for a country that has ever uh, happened in human history, in, in my view. Um, and so for a long time, I wrote about these kind of things and other things, too, as a reporter um, and didn't necessarily think that I would return to uh, the subject of the Civil War. And I, and, but I came back to it in an indirect sort of way, kind of going back through time from where we, we were. The magazine Alabama Heritage, um, which I really like, uh, and had the pleasure of writing for on occasion, asked me to write a piece about a guy named Benjamin Turner, uh, who was from Selma and was the first black congressman during Reconstruction. Uh, he served two years in the U.S. Congress from 1870 to 1872. And it turned out that Benjamin Turner was a most interesting guy. Uh, he had been a slave. Um, he had also, when he was quite young, learned to read. Uh, apparently, the, the, uh, his owner's children uh, helped teach him to read as they were learning to read, and this was something that Ben Turner valued very much, and so he was quite literate uh, when he grew up. 
his owner uh, in Selma also owned the St. James Hotel, which is still there, still operating in Selma. Uh, and when Mr. Gee uh, went off to fight uh, in the Civil War, he left his literate slave, Benjamin Turner, to run the hotel, which Turner did, ran it profitably during the remaining years of the Civil War. Turner also started his own livery stable business um, during the Civil War, and when the war ended, uh, he had amassed a relative fortune of something like $10,000, much of which he used immediately after the war was over to build the first school for black children uh, that had ever existed in Selma. <clears throat> he also became a member of the Selma City Council in 1868, but quit in protest because other members of the Selma City Council wanted to be paid the princely sum of $20 a month. And he thought that the city could not afford that because it was bankrupt and that all others should serve for the honor of serving, not for, for the mercenary uh, sum of $20 a month. And so he quit and said, if we can't serve for nothing, I'm not going to uh, serve at all. The sense of suffering and loss that they had endured in the Civil War. And this happened for a very specific reason. When the Union soldiers came uh, and began to do damage to the town. They burned uh, the Episcopal Church there that's, uh, that's still there uh, in Selma, and um, they, there was, they uh, sacked people's farms and stole their crops and stole their farm animals and so forth. And they did this to Benjamin Turner on the little patch of land where he lived. They took his crops and they took his uh, horses and mules as well. And, and so he filed, along with his white neighbors, after the uh, war was over, uh, official papers for, to be compensated for, for the damage that the Union soldiers had done. And so whether this was the reason or not, he was a man who believed that they were all in it together, white and black, the former slaves and the former slave owners, the former uh, slaves and the former Confederates. And so when Turner ran for Congress um, in 1870, his slogan was universal amnesty, universal suffrage. And by that he meant that um, nobody who had fought for the Confederacy ought to be punished for that, but that the former slaves like himself should have the right to vote. And in fact, he also believed in reparations, that they should be given land so that they could start uh, their lives. And so his vision for the South, which was way ahead of its time, was that uh, black and white were in it together and that we were all victims of this tragedy uh, that was known as the Civil War. Um, so I wrote about this unusual man uh, who um, the people know about in Selma. There's a monument to him in the Live Oak Cemetery where he's buried, but his uh, fame hasn't probably spread too much beyond that, but he seemed to me to be a really intriguing figure. But it somehow led me back through uh, some of the issues that we lived with in more recent times, back to the Civil War, and so I began to think about, again, uh, some of the stories that I'd been told and some of the letters that had been written in the family that tried to, uh, and tried to, reflect again on what the meaning of all of that might be. Um, it turned out what I discovered in those letters and what I write about in this book, Journey to the Wilderness, um, is, a, um, is, is the story of several different uh, members of the family. One was my great-great-grandfather, whose name was Thomas Gilliard who in about 1850 moved from Monroe County to Mobile. Um, and as the Civil War began, he was in his 70s. He was too old to fight. He was never optimistic about the war. Um, he did not think the South had a reasonable chance of winning. But when Alabama seceded, uh, he accepted that fact and voiced his support for the decision to secede 
even though he did it fatalistically with a fear that it was not going to turn out well. He worried constantly during the war about the fate of, um, of three sons and a grandson who were off in the fighting. Uh, his grandson, in fact, was killed by a Union sniper at Port Hudson, Louisiana. Um, his two sons, who were on the, uh, who were fighting in the Western Theater, uh, up and down the Mississippi River in places like Vicksburg and others, they were always reporting gloomy news from the front because on the Western Front in the war, from the Southern point of view, it, the news was hardly ever good. Um, they were, his two sons were captured uh, and imprisoned, later exchanged. Uh, two of them worked as surgeons, which was a terrible job to have during the Civil War. Field hospitals were quite primitive. Uh, often surgeries had to be performed with no anesthesia. Uh, people's limbs were amputated, and, and it was just a uh, really grim duty that two of them performed and sometimes apparently described to him in letters that they, that they wrote to him. Um, he had another son uh, named Franklin Gilliard who was fighting uh, in the Eastern Theater uh, un under uh, Robert E. Lee. And from Franklin, the news was sometimes better from the Southern point of view um, until uh, Gettysburg when Franklin wrote letters about what a tragic day that was for the southern forces. And then the news came from the Battle of the Wilderness in 1864 that Franklin, the sort of family firebrand and the most prolific letter writer during the Civil War, uh, had been killed in that battle in the, uh, in the wilderness areas of Virginia. Before he was killed, he wrote some remarkable letters. And one of the things I want to do here is share with you uh, a little bit of what he wrote uh, so that you can see why I was intrigued by these letters um, and wanted to compile them into a book and then reflect on what they, uh, on what they had to, to, uh, to say. Um, and I'm going to read you a passage that I wrote about the first letter that Franklin Gilliard wrote home from a battlefield. And it was after the first battle of Bull Run or the first battle of Manassas. Franklin's fateful journey as a soldier began with Fort Sumter and carried him bravely through some of the major battles of the war. The first was Bull Run, which was for Franklin a triumph as decisive as he could imagine. In a letter to his father soon after the fighting, he described the rout of the Union Army. They left artillery, small arms, muskets, rifles, coats, blankets, provisions, and everything. The skirmishing leading up to that moment began on July 18, 1861, and three days later, as the showdown loomed less than 50 miles from the nation's capital, so confident were the Union forces of victory that many members of Congress came out to watch. They brought their ladies and their picnic lunches and parked their carriages on a nearby hill, but their gaiety quickly turned to horror as the Confederates staged a bayonet charge having been urged by their leader, Stonewall Jackson, to yell like furies. It was the first time in the war that the rebel yell would ring through the fields, and the Union soldiers, still largely untrained, panicked at the sound. Franklin Gilliard was in the middle of it, with the 2nd South Carolina Regiment, where he would soon earn the rank of lieutenant colonel. He raced down a hill and passed the stream that was known as Bull Run, fighting not only the enemy in blue, but also his fear and finally his fatigue as the horrors of the scene unfolded all around him. You can form no idea, he wrote to his father, of the thirst created by the excitement and fatigue of battle, the indifference with which one regards the dead and the wounded is another astonishing feature. After the enemy had been driven off, I began to gather the canteens of the enemy for our own famishing men who could not leave ranks. The first I got containing water was on a dead man. The side of the canteen was bathed in blood up to the very mouth. My thirst was so great that regardless of this, I turned it so the water would run out the bloodless side, emptied it into my own canteen, and drank it. <clears throat> 
Before I went into battle, the very sight of the blood of a dead man would have caused me to shudder. After our own men had been provided for, I gave water to several of the wounded enemy. They seemed very grateful and were surprised by our kindness. It was so different from what their lying generals had represented to them. The battle sounded terrible, but the destruction of life was not nearly so great as would have been supposed from the sound. The moral effect of the victory cannot well be calculated. It has thrown confusion into the ranks of the enemy, and in spite of the confident and defiant resolution of their Congress, has involved the whole object of the war in doubt and distrust. I feel very hopeful that next spring will end the contest and bring a recognition of our independence. It may come before that time. Franklin Gilliard was a brave and good soldier. He was not a very good prophet. The war did not come to an end as he, uh, as he thought it would. And <clears throat> as I said, uh, particularly in, on the Western Front, uh, the news got worse and worse. Um, and my great-great-grandfather in Mobile, after learning of the death of his grandson uh, and the capture of two of his sons, wrote this letter to another member of the family. Oh, this terrible war. Who can measure the troubles, the affliction it has brought upon us all? It has pleased the Almighty to inflict upon us this severe chastisement. And it is our duty to submit in Christian spirit. We cannot foresee his ultimate purpose in thus scourging our people with the direst of calamities. But even in the depth of our sorrow, we can also see a glimmering of mercy. The contest is fasting, fast approaching a crisis, and I am not sorry for it. The sooner it is brought to an issue, the better. Let his will be done. Things continued to unravel from there. Um, he got word that his son Franklin had been killed and then he soon died thereafter. Um, on the day that General Lee surrendered in Appomattox, a battle was fought in Alabama at Fort Blakely, just north of Mobile. Uh, my great grandfather, Samuel Septimus Gilliard, was captured in that battle. Um, he was sent uh, to Ship Island off the coast of Mississippi um, <clears throat> and kept in a, uh, in a Union War prison there uh, for some months, uh, uh, even after the surrender of General Lee. The men who guarded the Confederate prisoners on Ship Island were African-American soldiers, uh, former slaves who were bitter about their captivity and my great-grandfather felt like he was uh, mistreated by them uh, and told stories of that. And so the, uh, the, the cruelty, as it was reported down through the years in our family, of black soldiers on Ship Island became part of the symbol in my family's mind of the defeat that the South and the humiliation that the South uh, suffered during the Civil War, and so a kind of racial resentment became uh, intertwined in that sense of history. Um, and it was something that was trans transmuted on down through the generations, and I learned about it as a kid and had to learn how to put that into some kind of perspective and decide what I myself was going to do about it and how I was going to deal with the uh, issue of race, which was part of this history in so many ways. Um, the surviving members uh, of the family who fought in the war eventually came home. They came home to a ravaged landscape. Uh, they came home to, um, uh, to uh, crops that had uh, had either rotted in the fields or in some cases had been burned by Union soldiers at various, in various parts of the South. They came home to uh, a sense of bitterness and a sense of loss. Um, and I want to read the, um, the, the ending of my essay leading into the letters, uh, and then I'll close and open it uh, for questions. Throughout the, letter, throughout the letters written by this family, 
We can hear 150 years later that fateful interplay of gallantry and pain, with the latter growing stronger as the war went on. And then came defeat, this final re and then came defeat. As this final reality settled hard on the South, there was no way to disguise it, no way to mitigate the despair. That task would fall to future generations, but at the time there were many like my great-great-uncle Rishbu Gilliard, who was twice taken prisoner during the war, and when it was over, returned to Alabama to try to pick up the pieces of his life. He found it hard, and in a letter to an uncle in South Carolina, written in 1866, he closed with this assessment of the future. Of politics, I will say only this. I see nothing ahead. All is dark and pretends no good for us in the South. And there it was, not just a momentary depression, but a mindset filled with defeat and distrust, a bleakness that seemed to have no bottom. No wonder the sons and daughters of the next generation searched for consolation, some noble echo of the fierce Southern pride that helped bring the nation to war in the first place. No wonder the heart and psyche of the South became such a tangled knot. No wonder it has taken us all so long to remember with compassion those who lived and died in the war. They helped create and also endured the greatest tragedy in the tragic history of our land. But a moment in which, along with everything else, our better angels managed to survive. And our nation emerged not only intact, intact but with the promise of greater freedom still ahead. Thank you very much. All right, we'll open it up for questions. If you would, please raise your hand, and either myself or Georgia Ann will pass the microphone to you. We're recording today's session, so we can make sure everybody can hear. Don't be shy. <laughs> Well, I have two questions, so okay. somebody else is asking. I'll ask them both. Uh, one is about how these letters were preserved, and that that's that's pretty amazing, and how how your 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 family kept them. Yeah, um, the most prolific letter writer was Franklin Gilliard. Um, he wrote home all the time from the field. Uh, from, from And he was in some horrific battles. I mean, most of the major battles that you can think of in Virginia and from, from Chickamauga to Gettysburg, he was in those battles. And yet he wrote all the time. His wife had just died before the uh, war. And so his children were being raised by his wife's sister. And he wrote either to her or to his children. And they kept all of those letters. And his um, grandchildren um, found the letters uh, written in this wonderful script, and they made typewritten copies of them. And then they eventually published them without comment, just all the letters of his that they could find uh, in, a, in a little book that's now long since out of print, though you can still find it in some historical libraries in in. Um, South Carolina. So that was the first and easiest place to find the letters. But again, it was an act of historical foresight and I think family love and honor that caused them to preserve those letters. And they, and Franklin was a journalist, so he was a good writer. And his descriptions of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Chickamauga, other things, I read parts of his description of the Battle of Bull Run. They are quite vivid, quite eloquent, and I think very powerful documents. Um, um, other uh, letters were, were preserved either as originals or as copies by other members of the family, but less systematically. And so I just kind of tracked down cousins who had one or two here or there. I had a few because my grandfather had given, I didn't have originals, he had made copies and he gave me, um, he gave me copies, but I, I had no doubt about their authenticity because, you know, he was old enough to have been part of preserving them in the first place. So, so I trusted that 
Uh, and again, just pull together from all of those sources uh, things that they had had the foresight to hang on to. You said you had two questions. Yep. So my, my second question is about your, your own reading about the period of Reconstruction and, and where have you been have you been influenced by anyone as you read about that period or or yeah I guess influenced is a good yeah, way to ask this. You know it's a uh, it, it, that's a very complicated time in history. I mean I was certainly raised with the traditional white southern view of Reconstruction that it was a time of great suffering for white people and that they finally uh, ended that by restoring white supremacy to its rightful place in Southern politics. Um, if, you know, that kind of understanding has changed over the years and scholars don't, don't subscribe only to that theory. Um, I think it actually contains some truth based on the, the uh, sense that my own family at least felt a sense of loss during those times. I don't think the white supremacy part of it was true. I've come to believe that that was, uh, that was pretty self-serving, but, but there was a sense of tragedy and loss and, and, uh, and so forth that pervaded my own family's story. But if you look at it from the other point of view, what must that period of time been like if you were not white? if you were African-American. It had to have been one of the great historical disappointments that any people have ever gone through because these folks had been enslaved and then they were free. And when they were free, they started to prepare themselves to expect uh, to take their place as citizens uh, of, the, of the country. Uh, they immediately, immediately began to establish schools and churches, colleges, those kind of things. If you go to most cities in Alabama or in other parts of the South and try to find the oldest black church, usually it will have been founded in 1866, 1867. It was one of the first things that, that former slaves did was begin to establish their own institutions. In 1866, a group of freed slaves came together for a convention in Mobile. They passed a, an, a remarkably eloquent resolution about their rightful place as citizens, but also about preparing themselves to take on their rightful place as citizens. And so to establish institutions of education, which they saw as the key to their future. And two of the former slaves who were at that meeting uh, left and went back to Talladega and founded Talladega College, now Talladega University, um, uh, immediately after the, the, the Civil War. So you had this time of soaring hope and amazing sense of possibility. Uh, and then it was all snatched away by a combination of political maneuvering by the Democratic Party, a new constitution in most southern states in Alabama in 1901, and also naked terrorism by the Ku Klux Klan um, that, that uh, has been well documented and spread across the South. Certainly we, we had it here in Alabama. So there are sort of competing experiences about this tragic time of reconstruction. And it seemed to me, that you had a few people uh, who saw the possibility of doing better than having black and white at each other's throat, but that they were overwhelmed by the passion of the times, and so it remained for another generation to really fully come to terms with the racial legacy that was also at the heart of the Civil War. I guess that's a complicated answer to your question, but I think it's a complicated time. I mean, my. You know, I, I think the, the, the greater tragedy of those times was the tragedy inflicted upon our black citizens, but I also feel a sense of some of the loss that my own family and other families felt in this time of deprivation and uh, in a time when they felt invaded again, uh, when there were um, Union soldiers sent to the South to enforce uh, Reconstruction. That may have been necessary. It was also painful to the people uh, uh, who were Southerners who, who saw them come. So I think, again, uh, we probably suffered as a country by the assassination of Abraham Lincoln uh, 
he may have uh, really uh, had a better idea, that whole with malice toward none kind of rhetoric that he uh, espoused. Um, but maybe even he would have been overwhelmed. I don't, I don't know. If he had served until 1868 as president, would it have been any different? Who knows? Yes. Uh, Frank, can you, can you talk a little bit more about the, the, the kind of the arc of sentiment within the family through the course of the war? I mean, I, I gather they started out reluctant, but then got in enthusiastic, or uh, can you just talk about it? Sure, yeah. Out? My, my great-great-grandfather, who was too old to fight, was reluctant from the very beginning. Um, he thought that there were too many Northerners uh, and too many factories in the North and that the South just never stood any kind of reasonable chance. So, so he, there, there are letters that he wrote uh, uh, expressing his, his grave concern before it even started. His son, Franklin, who fought in Virginia and at Gettysburg, uh, had, was actually a, an ardent secessionist who had sort of beaten the drums for secession um, uh, in a South Carolina newspaper before the war. And he felt great, um, great allegiance to the Southern cause. He saw the South as heirs to almost like a second American Revolution. He saw... Uh, he saw Robert E. Lee as the heir to George Washington, I mean, as in, in terms of his leadership and that kind of thing. And so he was enthusiastic about the war. And, but then you saw in the arc of his telling of the story uh, a sense of tragedy creeping in, particularly from Gettysburg uh, on to the end of the war. He saw the death toll mounting. Uh, he felt lucky. He... Um, was wounded once, but not so seriously that he had to miss much of the fighting until he was killed at, 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 at the wilderness. So you had a sense of blood, tragedy, loss creeping into his sort of gung-ho, the South is right kind of letters. And then you had um, the, his brothers writing from the West, and we don't have as many letters from them, but the ones that we do have are just gloomy. They just write about um, being captured and write about uh, one of them's son being killed and that kind of thing. So we don't have a real sense of how enthusiastic they ever were. We just knew that, we just know from the letters that bad things were happening to them and so they were, they were gloomy. So, so you had the old man who was fatalistic the youngest son, who was a firebrand for secession, and in between other brothers who just seemed kind of sober and then later bitter uh, in their experience. Does that, is that what you're driving? Is there ever any kind of blame, we shouldn't have done this? Or, uh, or? There, there was, there was um, the closest to that, um, the closest to that was the old man who, who said, uh, let God's will be done. Um, but there, the, it never seemed to produce that kind of introspection like, um, or that kind of reflectiveness. It went from, um, you know, the South is right to a bitter sense of loss. Um, and, and without, I never saw in any of the letters, uh, oh gosh, I wish we hadn't done it, you know, but there was a sense of, you know, this, this is a horrible thing that we, that we've all been through. Yes. Yeah, Fry, yeah I, uh, I want to ask a question regarding Horace King, the African American who was given credit for helping to erect the new capital. Now, uh, it was stated that he was responsible for building the uh, uh, stairway inside the Capitol. But there's been a lot of argument and concern that uh, he's not given credit for that. Has that changed, or have you heard anything about that? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, that some of those kind of, I don't know that story personally, and so I'm sorry to say, in fact, Ed may uh, have a better understanding of that than I do. But, you know, there are a lot of those kind of stories of people's, uh, you know, African-American people doing uh, 
these kind of things that we don't know about until much later, and you know yeah. that's always too bad. Uh, yeah. About two months ago, the historical commission put a uh, an image of, of King right to the left as you go in the front entrance to the Capitol by those staircases that he he built. So so it is acknowledged, and there's an image of him there now. Okay, good. I believe in tours that they have given at the Capitol, they have given King credit for years and years because I have heard, I've heard this story and I was told that when I went through it and heard told many times. So he's gotten credit for years. Was one of the surgeons Edmund Gilliard? Yes. From uh -huh. Camden? Yes. Yes, he was. <laughs> Who was the other? Son, uh, that was a surgeon. There was a surgeon, Samuel Septimus Gilliard, my great great grand, uh, my great grandfather. And it was Richburg and Edmund who came to Wilcox County. That's correct. Yes. Uh -huh. And then, they did they have a sister that married into the Howard family? They did. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Are you? Are we kin? Are we cousins? No, but <laughs> our ancestors were neighbors. Okay. All right. Their yeah. lands adjoined. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any idea about your female ancestors' thoughts on any of this? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, a, a, a little bit. Um, um, there there are fewer of their letters that survive. Part of that was endemic to the, you know, they were writing letters home to the front, and a lot of those letters got lost. So Civil War letters in general, the great number that survived were written by the soldiers home, although there are some examples of the opposite. Um, I have a colleague at South Alabama who's working on a collection of family letters that has a lot of letters from, from women uh, to the front. and. Uh, there are not as many of those in, in my family. I have anecdotally a couple of things. Um, there, there, were, there was a letter from, um, from the sisters of um, Franklin Gilliard uh, when Franklin was killed. And they just talked with sadness about the death of their brother. Um, they're, they wrote also about the death of their father, the old man in Mobile. Again, just a kind of sadness about, uh, about a family member's passing. Um, my great-grandmother, Susan Fry Gilliard was her name, was the one who rushed out to tell the Confederate soldiers to turn around and go back and fight. Um, I have uh, my on uh, another part of the family, um, the, Augusta Evans Wilson, the writer from Alabama, married into the family that, that uh, and she lived in Mobile, and she was uh, a very strong supporter of the Confederacy. Um, but there are other examples, you know, there, there's a, um, the, the, there have been more and more studies of the role of women during the Civil War, and um, um, and it's a whole, it's an interesting field that's only beginning to open up. There just isn't much in my own family about that. I wish there were more. I would love to know. I'd love to know more about that. Yep. All Anybody right. else? Anybody else? All right. There, oh. Yes. Uh, I'm okay. We're recording. Uh, there are many books about women uh, during the war between the states and uh, Confederate Memorial Library in Mar near Marbury has got books and uh, Emma Sansom was a real uh, hero to the, for the South and, and, and there are lots of women that were just unreal and uh, there are books and books. Yeah, good. Speaking of books, how many books have been published relative to the Gilliard family? River Plantation was the first. Yeah, the, and that was written uh, by a cousin of mine, Caroline Gilliard Hertel, 
Um, and uh, it's about the plantation that my great-great-grandfather established in Claiborne in, um, in Monroe County. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a period piece in some ways. It has, it has very much an Old South kind of uh, worldview to it, but it's also a wonderful record and an interesting historical look at the way not only uh, Thomas Gilliard and, and his family lived, but the way they are remembered uh, by, by subsequent generations. Um, you know, I wrote a book called Lessons from the Big House, which is, uh, follows one, one line of, of the family through 12 generations, um, ending with my daughters. Um, um, there, there are others, you know, we, we, we tend to write about ourselves, you know, we, um, we, we have a, there's a good bit of ancestor worship in my, in my family, but it's been around a long time. The Gilliards got off the boat in Charleston in 1680, and we can trace them back further than that, where there were French Huguenots trying not to get killed by Catholics in France. So, um, one of them, in fact, was killed on the rack in France many, many centuries ago. So, you know, it... It's colorful stories, and uh, you know there've been a few, been a few books written for sure. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so I appreciate much. you coming out. And nice talking to you.